speak loudly. There we are. There we are. Well, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Anita Farrington. I'm the Associate Dean of Student Affairs, and I would like to welcome all of you today to our fall 2015 Spotlight Series. We started this tradition a couple of years ago, and we are absolutely delighted to be here today. Very, very special and distinguished guest with us. Uh, this program today is sponsored by the Office of Student Affairs, and we are in partnership in hosting this event with the NYU Leadership Initiative. Uh, very happy to be partnering with our colleagues from across the river. Today, our distinguished guest is Christina Johnson. She is founder and CEO of Cube Hydro Partners and Enduring Hydro as well as having served as the former Undersecretary of Energy. Now, in addition to hearing about her company's commitment to renewable hydropower and reducing our nation's reliance on harmful carbon-based energy, our own professor, Chris Day, will be conducting the interview, actor studio style. Chris Day is from the Department of Technology, Culture, and Society. I'm sure that many of you know her. And then she also serves as Associate Dean for Administration. And in addition to exploring this field, of course, entertaining your questions, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. Christ Christina will also be talking about the importance of leadership, and uh, particularly through the lens of her own professional career. And I'm, I'm certain we'll be offering some great advice uh, she has a fan base here at Tandon School of Engineering. You surrounded her uh, the first couple of minutes, which is great. So that was exactly the welcome that we hoped that you would deliver. And uh, now we're going to get started. I'm going to step out of the way and bring a good friend and colleague up to do the official welcome remarks. Uh, at the very end, I should mention, uh, you'll have the chance to hear a few words from Bethany Godso. And Bethany is Associate Vice President of Student Leadership Initiatives at NYU, and it's just been a joy uh, working with Bethany and pu pulling this event together. Uh, special thanks to my team. I'm getting all the thank yous in on the front end. So now, please give a warm welcome to this gentleman. I don't know uh, how many of you know the amazing work that Kurt Becker is doing. He wears a couple of hats here. He is a professor, but he's also Vice Dean for Research innovation and entrepreneurship, and we couldn't think of a better person to deliver welcome remarks on behalf of the school and talk about some of the exciting research projects, some of the exciting programs uh, that are here in place. So without any further delay, Kurt Becker, please come on up. So I have to use the microphone, huh? Okay. Well, thanks for the nice introduction. Not much better here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, first order of business, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the NYU Tandon School of Engineering and also on behalf of our Dean and President, uh, Katapali Srinivasan, who sends his regards and his regrets for not being here, but he's traveling today in New Jersey and couldn't make it back in time. I thought a little bit what I was going to say as welcoming remarks. And then <coughs> it occurred to me, we had a little conversation. I just mentioned we had a delegation of 21 Chinese visiting our cleantech incubator, Acre, on the 19th floor of 15 Metrotech. It was a little challenge <coughs> because the 21 Chinese did not speak a word of English. I don't speak any Chinese. They had a translator who spoke a little bit of English. So it was an hour and a half of really trying to really understand what they were asking and me conveying what we're doing. But it's interest, it was interesting to learn from them that the startup culture in China is exploding with a lot of emphasis on clean tech and clean energy related startups. And by God, the country can really need it. Uh, I want to spend just two minutes to tell you a little bit about our own, the School of Engineering's uh, clean energy related activities. It all started in 2009, when the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, issued a request for proposals to establish clean tech incubators across New York State. We raised our hand, we submitted a proposal, and we were one of seven or eight winning uh, proposals, and we established, back then in Manhattan, 
in on, on Varick Street, the accelerator for a clean and resilient economy, abbreviation ACRE, which is our signature clean energy related incubator. We're now six years later, ACRE is still going strong. It's no longer on Varick Street. About two years ago, we opened a spectacular space on the 19th floor of 15 Metrotech, which became the hub of all clean energy related activities at the School of Engineering. First and foremost, it is home to the incubator. Secondly, it is also home to a clean energy proof of concept center, which targets technologies prior to company formation. We are looking at breakthroughs in academic research labs and provide bridge funding to assess the, uh, these technologies and see whether there's a market need for them. And thirdly, we also have a workforce development program, Clean Start, where we offer educational opportunities to professionals in other industries who would like to transition into the clean energy sector. So all in all, the Urban Future Lab, which is the facility that houses all these uh, clean tech activities, is humming. There is a, an event there tonight, otherwise you might have actually looked at hosting this event up on the 19th floor. And the companies that we have are working very hard and they're also very successful. And I want to share one final piece of good news with you. You're probably familiar with the TechCrunch Disrupt Pitch Competition in California. An acre company, Acrylist, won the first prize two weeks ago. The clean tech <laughs> is very much alive at the Tandon School of Engineering. With this, I end my remarks and hand it over to you, Chris. All right, um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to interview Dr. Johnson, but before I get started, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her, and I've been warned in advance that she has a reputation for being rather modest, um, so she's probably gonna dread this, but, um, but I can't, uh, can't forego the opportunity to tell you about all the amazing things that she's done, and knowing a bit about her background will help you to understand her remarks later on. So you already know that Dr. Christina Johnson served as the Undersecretary at the U.S. Department of Energy um, in 2009 and 2010. But before she went there, she was the provost, which is the position of the person who's in charge of the whole academic enterprise, and also the senior vice president at the Johns Hopkins University. Um, prior to that, she was the dean of engineering at the Pratt School of Engineering at Duke. And, um, but she's a Stanford grad for her BS, MS, and PhD, so she comes to us from the other coast. Uh, she did a postdoc at Trinity College in Dublin, and um, somewhere in there she was also on the faculty for some time at the University of Colorado at Boulder. What's especially interesting about her are her numerous awards and accomplishments, so I'm gonna um, take just a minute and tell you about some of them. She is an NSF presidential young investigator and a former Fulbright faculty scholar. She's received the Dennis Gabor Prize for Creativity and Innovation in Modern Optics, as well as the John Fritz Medal in Engineering. She was inducted into the Women in Technology International Hall of Fame and received the Society of Women Engineers Lifetime Achievement Award. She's received the ARCS Foundation Eagle Award for Science and Education, the Women of Vision Award for Leadership from the Anita Borg Institute, for Women in Technology. She's a member of the Colorado Women Hall of Fame and the National Inventors Hall of Fame. She's received the Milton Stewart Award from the Small Business Technology Council, and she is a member of every prestigious engineering-related society you could imagine, including a fellow of the Optical Society of America, the IEEE, the International Society for Optical Engineering, and the American Association for Advancement of Science. She holds over 118 U.S. and international pat uh, patents and has published nearly 150 referred journal publications and has co-founded several companies that she's, I hope, going to have a minute to tell us about today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. So to get started, um, and, and following this long list of accomplishments, I'm sure some of our students are sitting there thinking they will never have anything in common with someone like you. Um, so to bust that myth, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how um, some of your interests as a young person and how you got started in engineering. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
the former president of Polytech gave me my first uh, break, if you will, in the academic world. David Chang hired me when he was chair of the Department of uh, Electrical Engineering at Colorado, so that's how I got started. Um, well, as a young person, I had a very keen interest in the environment, and that was really informed um, by my favorite eighth grade science teacher, Mr. Charles Botnelli. And he, um, he was really very serious about the environment. And if you remember, when, when I was in seventh or eighth grade, now I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I think that was the first year of Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970. So that coupled with, um, you know, this love of the environment. Uh, one of my first interests was cleaning up trash in street blocks and recycling cans. And one day my mother came into the basement and literally knee-high in aluminum cans. So that was the end of my recycling <laughs> career. But she used to get paid 11 cents for a pound, and one can was a pound. Uh, but today, still in my neighborhood in D.C., I pick up the trash and recycle on the way to the metro and back. So it's, it's been a lifelong passion, picking up trash. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Modest right? beginnings. Um, and, and I've also read about you that as a young person, in addition to this interest in science, you were also active in sports. I wonder if when you were young, was that an unusual sort of profile for a young woman? Well, it's interesting because uh, I was in high school when Title IX happened. So this may be hard to, to appreciate now, um, but my high school didn't have sports for women. It, they had individual sports for women. So we had a swim team, a track team, and a tennis team. But I think maybe, I don't know why, but we didn't have a basketball team, we didn't have a volleyball team, didn't have a softball team. So, um, and I didn't think it was unusual. I wanted to play on a team. I wanted to be part of something bigger. And I think that was a passion that has really helped me in my career. So I went out for the boys lacrosse team. Now, any of you watch men's lacrosse? It's serious. Rather violent, actually. <laughs> so uh, I had pads and a helmet. And um, my first game, the coach actually put me in, much to my surprise. And um, the ball after the faceoff came rolling to me, so I went to pick it up. But that's the last thing I remember. I got <laughs> crushed. Well, then my the guys on my team, you know, the bench cleared, and then a big fight broke out, and they called the game. And um, then on the way home, my boyfriend uh, rear-ended a police car, and so I broke my nose. And then we went to the hospital. So it was, you know, it, uh, my athletic career got off to a little rough start. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when I went to Stanford, um, this is the first year my roommate was the first woman to go to Stanford on an athletic scholarship. Um, Susie Hagee, who's a great tennis player. So I, I founded the lacrosse program then and got all the other kids that played lacrosse, mainly on the East Coast that had sports in high school and we started playing and, and that was really a, a terrific opportunity to get involved in something, again, bigger than yourself in college. Excellent, excellent. Um, this is a good segue to the next question um, because we are co-sponsored by the MIU Leadership Initiative, so we're especially interested in learning more about your leadership experiences. So can you remember what might be one of your first or your early examples of being in a leadership position and, and did you think of yourself as a leader at that time? You know, I think it goes back to that first Earth Day. Uh, we formed an environment club, and I, I met the president of, of several of the clubs, the graduate student clubs, uh, and uh, also uh, African Americans in, in uh, energy club. So I had a chance to meet several of your leaders, and just like yourselves, you start a club, you hope someone comes to the first meeting, right? So that was um, a big, my biggest fear was when we formed the environment club, would anybody show up? And I think that you just do things. Um, I remember then when I was at Stanford, so we started the lacrosse club, we didn't have any money. So if you ask about leadership, I think you step back and say, what is leadership? And uh, I think leadership is about vision. It's about the ability to get a team together to, to carry out the vision. It's about getting resources and making an impact. So it's kind of simple. You just have to have vision. You have to be able to get resources. You have to get a team together, and then you have to do something. So uh, we didn't have any money for some of the women's the, the lacrosse club, but that was the time when world team tennis was just starting out. So Billie Jean King's office was 
up the road in San Mateo. So I just called her up. I said I wanted to come and talk to you about organizing a tennis match between the Golden Gators and the Stanford tennis team. And my roommate had been a freshman, and she thought it was a good idea, I, who was on the tennis team. Uh, so we actually rode up on my little motorcycle, you know, parked it out in front, and left the helmet there so I wouldn't, you know, like put it on Billie Jean King's desk. Well, <laughs> she didn't actually live there, you know, so we met with her head, Chris Klein, and they humored us and all that. But lo and behold, we actually pulled it off. We hosted the Golden Gators, played Stanford. We lost, Stanford lost. 26 to 25 in points. I'm not sure how it scored, or 26, 24, but it was a pretty entertaining match. And my roommate and her roommate beat Virginia Wade and her roommate and the Golden Gators. So it was all the way around a great party. Uh, we sold out Maples Pavilion, and we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. So again, it's. Um, I was telling the students earlier, you know, the wonderful thing about being a student at a university, there really is nothing you can't do. Because everybody here has the goal of, of trying to empower you and mentor you and make sure you're successful because you're our legacy. So, excellent, uh, that's fascinating. Um, so fast forward, you graduated from college, you became an engineer um, and moved into leadership positions in engineering. I wonder if you'd be willing to share with us, maybe not your very worst, but one of your memorable failures. I mean, as, as professors, we always tell our students, you can't be afraid to fail, fail fast, you know, this is important. Um, and maybe not so easy to talk about, but would you be willing to share with us a, a something you remember about an experience you would classify as a failure and what you learned from it? Sure, there's so many. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if we have enough time. Um, so I'd like to choose one, thinking again on, on uh, from athletics and, and one from engineering. Okay. If you don't mind. Perfect. Can I take two of the top yeah. ten? <laughs> so athletics. I really only had one dream in my life, and that's I wanted to be an Olympic athlete. But my sisters and brothers were very accomplished swimmers, and my sister barely missed making the 1964 Olympics. We have uh, seven kids in our family, and I'm at the younger end, she's at the older end, but she was tremendous. But at the time, they didn't have a lot of women participating in, in really the team sports in swimming, so there weren't that many women that actually went to the games, uh, which were, I believe, 64 was, uh, was Tokyo. I was very young then, and I, I don't remember the whole competition and everything, but I, I've learned since then. So she came in third and fourth in our two major events, and they take the top two. So I just wanted to be like her, and I, wa I thought if she can be an Olympian, I can be an Olympian. Now, we do have the same mother and father, but that's where the genes stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that what I didn't realize is I didn't really have the talent to be world class, but I gave it my best, and I, I knew what I could do maybe as well as any other kids was to train, and so I trained very hard. And there's a gal on our team, which is since she's in the uh, Stanford Hall of Fame, and a very dear friend, a great athlete, Nancy White. She's Wizard White's daughter, and she was an Olympian in field hockey and also was a great lacrosse player. Um, there's one time when we were working out together, and the whole team was there, and I was probably the, if I can say I had one thing going for me on the team, I was the most fit. I couldn't play, but I was the most fit. So I was like the rabbit in a race. So we would do suicides, you know, up to 50 back, up to the 40 back, up to 30 back, and we'd repeat that 10 times. And so the coach put me against Nancy. Um, and I didn't let her dog one of those. And at the end of it, she just said, nice race. So to race 10 suicides in a row, you know, that did not endear me to everybody on the team. But I think that what I learned from that is now reflecting on it, it's one of my best memories from college, but I didn't enjoy it at the time. Well, it's hard to enjoy suicides at the time, let's be <laughs> real, you know, because then you go throw up and like who enjoys that? But I, I think if I had enjoyed the journey more, if I had just enjoyed the fact that I was out there competing and I was too focused on making the team and making the U.S. team, and that really wasn't what it was about. So I think that was my biggest lesson. It was just not everybody is going to be an Olympian but what the heck, it's nice to know what you're made of. And I think that was that lesson. Um, I think a short, short little lesson in engineering. So s we formed our first company, um, Color Link, and we made these color shutters. So a piece of glass, you apply an electrical field to them, they change color, right? So we'd make these, and you know, I don't know, they cost maybe a thousand bucks, and we had a great markup, and we sold them to the Australian Air Force. 
Well, a couple months later, they came back in a box, and they were destroyed. I'm like, what'd you do to them? Well, we flew them at 50,000 feet. I said, well, what'd you do that for? Well, you sold them to the Australian Air Force. What did you <laughs> think we were going to do with them? And we hadn't tested them for, for uh, mean time between failure. We didn't test them at altitude. We didn't test them at temperature. We didn't test them for G4. I didn't even know what any of that was. So, and I was an engineering professor, which is even scarier. So I think understanding and getting a return of your first parts that you built that you thought they were terrific, uh, that was a real eye-opener. And, uh, and we almost lost the, the company. I mean, they were great. We gave them their money back. They didn't sue us, which is good. But that was a kind of a, I think, a failure. <laughs> And a good lesson. Yes. Um, can you tell us now, you've had so many opportunities to serve in leadership roles, how would you characterize your guiding values as a leader? You know, I think each, uh, I've had a great opportunity to serve in a university setting and in a government setting and in a corporate setting. And I think each one of those, I learned something different. So I will start with the government setting. I think um, one of the biggest things we learned in government, and I don't know if Mike Holland is here from CUSP, but uh, you met me earlier, we served together. And the biggest thing is not to surprise people, right? No one wants a surprise. And uh, particularly if you know your boss's boss is the President of the United States, it's very bad. <laughs> so um, I fortunately never surprised them, which was very good. And uh, the second thing is you really never want to be in the newspaper never want to be in the newspaper. So th that was good, too. Um, so that's some of the things I learned from, from government. And no surprises, communicate well. So I think in terms of values, it's, it's communication. It's being prepared. So that's what I learned from the university. Uh, when you're in a university setting, and you have all these smart folks like you're in the room, and you have faculty and postdocs and great staff, they're going to challenge you. So if you're not prepared, you're going to hear about it. I'm sure you've had that experience. And so what I learned to do is to always ask myself, if I was listening to my talk, where would be the holes in it and what questions would I ask? And then I'd write down those questions, I'd find the answers, and then I'd be prepared. So I think it was really get to know the details. And I learned a lot of that from Secretary Chu, who I had the pleasure of serving under when I was in the government, is you've got to understand the details. So, we, um, so that was a good lesson, you know, communicate, be prepared. I think, though, the biggest thing that I've learned, um, and that's when I was a, was dean at Duke, is um, and at Colorado, one of my students who uh, was from China told me, you know, professor, uh, people want to know you care before they care what you know. And I think that that was stuck with me for the last 30 years because it is so true. People don't are going to tune out unless. Um, you know, it's what Maya Angelou said. It's people aren't going to remember what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So communication, being prepared, caring, and kindness. It's really easy to be kind. You just don't have to be mean. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's kindness goes a long way because, and you're kind by giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, it's almost the opposite of see something, say something. It's, you know, Here's something, don't feel you have to repeat it, unless it's true and helpful. So I think those are some of the things. Those are excellent lessons. Um, let's shift focus a little bit and talk about some of the interesting work you've had an opportunity to be part of. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your life as an engineer? What are some of the most interesting projects now as you reflect back that you've had a chance to work on? I uh, did my PhD uh, at Stanford in three-dimensional display of medical data. And we're trying to find a way so that physicians who would be operating on individuals could get a three-dimensional view. I mean, we're, this is a long time ago. You have to understand, it was over 30-some years ago. So we didn't, holography was really just in its heyday. We didn't have holographic stamps or, or, or uh, toys yet. So really understanding how to see things in 3D was a passion. And I actually had some um, medical issues when I was in graduate school. I had Hodgkin's disease, which is a cancer of the lymph system. So for my thesis, I actually used the medical data, my own. Um, I probably violated HIPAA, but I gave permission, so it was okay. <laughs> um, and that was really interesting, just to kind of see what, what the tumors look like, and, and to sort of it, it comes through today, I brought a prop. I know, attractive, right? So. These are glasses, if, if you've seen the movie Avatar or Gravity or any of those, these glasses my students and I invented 
along with the optical projection. So you could actually see 3D movies in full color with pretty, pretty good, I would say, if I do say so myself, which I guess I did, um, clarity and vision. So that's probably one of the most interesting things. The first time we built these, these glasses, and, and there's more than just the glasses, it's really the 3D projector. Um, it was about this, this thick, and we built it out of big, thick crystals, oriented at different angles that would be able to take in light and separate them based on uh, polarization and color. And then we found these thin films out of um, Nidodenko that were used for displays. And actually, these um, glasses are, are probably about 20 to 25 thin films sandwiched together. And you know we spent millions, and now they give them away for free. But that's what happens. <laughs> so, and uh, so that was one project. And then the th the projector, we really kind of cornered the market, which is a big lesson. In the early 2000s, if if you went to Best Buy or, or um, Circuit City, I don't even know if it was Circuit City back then, but it's definitely Best Buy. You could buy in the 3D pr rear projector. They used our color quad, which was one of our inventions. Now I say that was a lesson because we cornered the market for all of five years, and after that, you can't buy one anymore. So the technology window opens and closes, and you either have to jump in, and you jump in, and, and y you do well, and then you've got to reinvent yourself. So we were doing 2D displays, got the market on rear projection, we were selling millions of our color quad, and then all of a sudden the market was closed, we had to figure out something else to do. So that's when we came up with the 3D projector and the glasses, so kind of comes full circle. Oh, that's a great segue to the next question. So you've been active throughout your career on entrepreneurship and innovation, and um, these are very much a hallmark of our school here. I wonder, uh, I know a lot of our students out here are interested in getting some advice from you about what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur or innovator. Any tips you could share? Well, I'll try and be brief, because um, I think I've been a little long-winded. But um, So when we started out, we were doing two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. We were doing, I mentioned the color shutter we sold to the Australian Air Force and got it returned. Well, that was a piece of glass that could rapidly change colors. We were trying to give a cheaper version of the, at the time, the three-gun CRT, if you've ever seen that in old movies or something. Uh, yeah, okay, well, anyway, <laughs> back in the day, there were these three CRTs that you would project through color filters. And so we wanted to just use one CRT, but rapidly cycle through the colors. And the problem was that some people got nausea when they see the cycling it's of the color sequential filter. And that sort of killed that product, frankly. But um, you know, I in the end of the day, what we realized was we had invented really great technology, but we were applying it to the wrong thing. So we had to step back and say, everybody's buying this. We're making this, but everybody's buying this. How can we make that better? And so one of the things that I did I took a year off from the University of Colorado in 1998, and I, uh, we needed customers because <laughs> obviously we lost the Australian Air Force. So I decided that I would go to see a customer every week for a full year. So 48 weeks I was on the road, and I spent two weeks in Japan where I had four meetings a day. I visited all the S companies, Sharp and Sanyo and, and um, Sony and Canon and Toshiba, you name it, I was there. And every time I'd show them the shutter, they keep pointing to something else. So finally I gave up, went home to the hotel room, and I drew out what I thought they needed that we could do better. Faxed it back to the engineers who then finished the design, and that was our big breakthrough. That was what was called the color quad, which as I said, we cornered the market for five years. So I think that thinking about it, you have to not be wedded to the technology. You have to be wedded to solving a problem and providing something people want. And after 48 weeks on the road, I really got it. <laughs> Everybody said, we want that, not that. So I think the first thing is you gotta know your market and you've gotta do something that people wanna buy. And I think the, the second thing is you have to be tenacious and resourceful and you can never give up. I'd hire 100 people who knew very little but just had one thing, they're passionate and don't give up. Because if you refuse to lose, you will not lose. And that is really what it takes. And then the third is just be prepared for three to five years of a lot of struggle before you break through. It'll take at least three years. If you're lucky, three years. You know, four years is kind of the breakthrough. We're on year five. After five years, you'll know if you can make it or not. So thanks. That's excellent. Daunting, but 
but excellent. <laughs> um, so since leaving government, you focused a lot of your energy on hydropower. Um, why? Wh what do you see as the potential for hydropower in the U.S. or the world? Right. Well, we have a company that we did a joint venture with a private equity firm here in New York called I Squared Capital. It's the uh, former Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Fund guys, and they just closed on $3 billion. And we believe there's tremendous opportunity in, the, in North America. We're focused right now in North America. There are 80,000 dams in the U.S., and 77,000 of those don't produce electricity. So that's a lot of opportunity. I mean, you can take down all the dams you want. There's still going to be dams that will be there because of, uh, of navigation, flood control, recreation, irrigation. So why not get clean electricity out of them? So the first project, we, we bought a license for a dam in western Pennsylvania that in 1941, when it was finished, it had been designed with the idea of putting hydropower in it. But the war broke out, and they had other uses for steel, so it never got powered. So they plugged the hole through the dam with concrete. So 2012, we bought the license. 2013, we started shipping out the concrete. And by the end of 2013, we're producing enough power to fully light 2,000 homes, take, uh, I think the numbers are like 4,000 cars off the road, and mitigate the same amount of CO2 as having planted a million fully grown trees in the rainforest. That's just from this small little plant. And uh, that's really, we, we got on a roll from that, then we showed how we could do this. Now we have 13 plants that are operating, we're about ready to close on an additional five so that now we have the resources to start developing plants from, from scratch. So that's really, um, I saw the opportunity because we, at, at DOE, during the Recovery Act, we helped launch through the Recovery Act and the 30% uh, cashback grant, uh, a lot of great companies like Sunrun, Solar City, Sungevity, um, where you, you took away the barrier to clean electricity when you say, we will install a solar power panels for free and take back a long-term power purchase agreement. And by owning those panels and leasing it to people, y you as a customer, and, and I, I do not own stock in any of these companies, I'm not on their boards, but I admire them, um, you can actually get it for free. And then your electricity bill, you pay them monthly, but it tends to be cheaper than if you bought the regular power from, from the um, utility. So I think that was really important, and I saw that happening. I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, and then wind, similarly. And now with storage coming up, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. I do think we're seeing a whole different sort of tr um, really sea shift there. But no one was really paying any attention to hydropower. So I thought, well, you know, this is the underdog, the original renewable, the forgotten renewable. It's the largest renewable in the U.S. It powers you know, somewhere between 7 and 9% of our electrical needs. Back in the 30s, it was more than 30, 40%. In the Northwest, it's uh, probably 70 to 75%. So I thought it would be a pretty interesting thing to look at. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I became an electrical engineer because my dad was a hydropower engineer, and he worked for Westinghouse. And he died when I was a sophomore in college. And uh, I became an engineer because I didn't really feel I got to know him. And I thought if I got to know what he loved in engineering, that would make me closer to him. As I got older, I took more you know, interest in you know, the, the history. Uh, my granddad also worked for Westinghouse. He actually worked for George Westinghouse. And I found some of uh, his original papers. He died when my dad was five. I think my dad became an electrical engineer in order to find out what his dad loved. So it's been a three-generation pursuit, and now I tell the, the kids of the next generation, somebody's got to give us an engineer, and we need a fourth generation here. So <laughs> This was your destiny. <laughs> it was our destiny. I think now might be a good time to open it up to questions from our audience. I know we have some students who are prepared with questions who represent some of our clubs, so maybe we could start with those individuals. So if you are a student who's here on behalf of one of the clubs that came prepared with a question, why don't we start with yours? Do we have any of those folks here? What, what about you right over here, second from the end? I'll bring you a mic. Hold on. Uh, my name is Shruti. So my Hello. question is that definitely hydropower is the future, but during the development, if, F if it affects the aquatic ecosystem, 
So how, can, how are you gonna make sure that you're gonna mitigate the footprint on the aquatic ecosystem while developing hydropower? Right, so the, um, we don't build dams, so we are powering existing dams. And when we entered into our memorandum of understanding with the Army Corps, we agreed to zero environmental quality degradation. So we have sensors that are on the water and we look at dissolved oxygen and if the dissolved oxygen drops below seven milligrams per liter, which is actually the oxygenation of a pristine stream in Alaska, which in western Pennsylvania is not exactly a pristine stream in Alaska, but that's okay, we shut down. And if the temperature drops, depending on the year, you know, whether it's spawning or not, um, either drops or actually increases above a certain value, we shut down, so we don't operate. And then there's been a lot of um, improvement in the technology so there's ways to aerate so that you can infuse um, bubbles into the, uh, uh, and oxygenate. So I think that's very helpful too. Um, there's several types of hydropower. So there's so-called run of river. And the run of river is you don't take water away from the stream. You might divert it, run it through a turbine, and then return it. So that's run of river. Um, a lot of the problem came when people take water out and not return to the stream. And that was for purposes of irrigation, which we, we understand, but that does damage the aquatic system. So I think we have to be very environmentally sensitive. And I think one of the things that I bring to um, our company is a long history of concern for the environment. So great question. We, um, another type of hydro is new stream reach, is what they call it. And those do involve building dams. Now I'm not saying that all dams that all rivers you know, may not have the opportunity to, to put in a dam, but I think you have to be very careful about it. And also way, there are some countries that are borderline seas and salination, so then you have to weigh, if that water goes into the ocean and becomes sal uh, salinated, then you have to desalinate for water, and that's another impact on the environment. So, you know, energy is pretty straightforward, I think. It is, though, multifaceted. So you have to take all these into account. We have our next question from another student leader. Please. Good evening, Dr. Johnson. My name is Cedric and I'm representing Abe. And our question is, what do you see or rather identify as the greatest challenge within the general energy industry and more specifically within the hydro energy sector? And how can you go about addressing the challenge and finding a solution? Fabulous question. Um, not that I expected anything else from this terrific audience. That would be me trying to stall for time to answer your question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I, I think th it, from my perspective, the largest and biggest challenge is I, I think that every person appreciates that we want an a, a very good environment to live in. We don't want air pollution. We don't want water pollution. But then it costs something in order to preserve that environment. And that's where the, the, the social contract starts to break down. So I think that one of the biggest challenges is getting people to have the vision that they're gonna have to pay for cleaning up the environment and for changing the way we use energy, we waste energy. Um, and, and that's really the challenge is getting people to be serious about how we're going to change the environment, uh, change the, our approach to degrading the environment. And also appreciating that um, uh, there was a researcher in Boston who passed away in the last couple of years, Paul Epstein. So he's with the Harvard uh, Global Health, uh, School of Global Health in, in Institute. I probably have, have butchered the name, my apology. But he wrote a very interesting article on the true cost of carbon on healthcare effects. And if you look at the emphysema and individuals that, that uh, have premature mor morbidity due to uh, the quality of the air, it would triple the cost of coal-based electricity. So if you take into account all the costs, renewable energy is cheaper. But we don't have people pay directly for that. They pay indirectly through higher health care premiums and, and other impact uh, on the environment and a shorter livelihood and less productivity for society. And it's very difficult to quantify that. So it's getting the political will to either put a tax, a carbon tax on it, 
at a federal level. Uh, sometimes people say, and I forget who said this, but uh, countries talk why states and cities act. You see this happening. You see this happening in California. You see it happening in, in a lot of cities. Uh, New York is a, a great leader in terms of renewable energy. So I think it's just us acting. And that's uh, not acting out, but acting appropriately and, and going after this problem and being committed to it. You know, it's just too bad we, at the first oil crisis, I, I think about, the thing about vision, right? So when I was a, a kid graduating from college, every major problem, which is almost 40 years ago, every major problem we have today, you could see it coming back then. We had the first oil crisis. You know, we had the hostage crisis. All these things that happened have only amplified their difficulty for us to address them because we didn't get at them early enough. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Ishan. And my question is, uh, hydropower is considered as the most important renewable energy resource. Then uh, what is the uh, major challenge to development and what are the disadvantages of uh, hydropower? Sure. Well, of course, there's no disadvantages. No, <laughs> just kidding. Well, so hydropower, if you think of all the renewables, right? So, so solar is diurnal. I, the sun is diurnal. You know, it's on during the day and off at night, I guess, by definition. Wind is more weekly. Hydropower is seasonal. So there's more hydropower in the winter and the, the shoulder seasons than there are in the summer. So I actually think, and, and no one's really done this well, but I would love to do this, and we actually may be doing our first project where you integrate the wind, hydro, and solar together. And we've started to model solar and hydro with some of our plants so that we can provide a very flat profile. So the advantages with hydropower is it's very fast responding. It can go up and down and deliver very rapidly uh, so that it can stabilize the grid. Uh, the disadvantages for powering those 77,000 dams that exist is just the permitting and the um, licensing. It's the number of studies, which is appropriate to do the studies, but there are three different agencies that you have to satisfy. If they're an Army Corps, for example, dam, and you have the uh, environmental protection agencies at the state level, all very important. You have the Army Corps that owns the dam, and then you have the federal government, FERC. And so they're not all aligned on what they want. And so there's, a, there's some time delay in trying to get through the various permitting and processing. So. Actually, I think that what we need is just a, a, a concerted effort to decide we are going to do this. Now, let me turn this back a little bit and support those three government agencies. So first of all, you absolutely want to have environmental studies done so that you make sure that you do hydropower in a very uh, appropriate way. Second is if you're the Army Corps and you own that dam and someone wants to touch that dam and you're liable for it, for it breaching, you want to be sure they're very serious people. And there are lots of folks that were speculating in hydropower permits who would get a permit, but they were never serious about really building it. If they're not serious about building it as an engineer, you know, Australian Air Force, they send back our shutter, you know, they weren't in a war or anything like that, nobody got hurt, right? I just lost a lot of money, that's okay. But with regard to the Army Corps, if you don't have a serious engineer designing it who understands failure and failure analysis, then that puts them at risk. So I understand the agencies and why they do what they do. We just need to have a streamlined process. We need Congress to basically adopt, in my view, use it or lose it. We'll give you a permit for three years. But after that, if you haven't broken ground and gotten it funded and financed, you're done. So let someone else do it. I think that would help a lot. So that's the biggest challenge we have. Our next question over here. Hi, so my name is Chandraga Kanuri and I'm, and I'm representing um, Student Council and Alpha Omega Epsilon today. Um, this is more to do with a general question as you, a woman in STEM. So what are some of the challenges that you faced as a woman in STEM, um, or challenges in general, if that's what you would like to answer, and um, how did you overcome them? Right. So. All through high school, I, I had a wonderful high school experience. I mean, the guys on the lacrosse team, they didn't ever think it was strange that I went out for the team, which I'm still boggles my mind now. I just had my 43 union. I'm like, really, you guys? You were really forward thinking. 
that wasn't really an issue. Um, but when I went to college, I have to say that um, it was the first time that I recognized that um, there weren't a lot of women in my classes. There weren't. I didn't have a lot of female faculty either. So I had two professors in eight years um, who were women. So y you know, you're you're inspired by people that you can identify with, and so. And I identified, of course, with my male faculty from intellectual and pursuit and being you know, serious about research. But they didn't look like me. And I have to say that I never thought I could be a faculty member. In fact, I didn't think it was going to be a career for me until departments throughout the country started recruiting me because uh, you know, my professor was really well known. That was helpful. Um, so that was really an eye opener. You know, and when I would. Um, go to class, I might be the only woman in the class, and I think that that made it a little bit challenging. Um, and I, I think one time, one of my professors told me it would be uh, <coughs> more important for me to be a hockey player, field hockey player, than a uh, engineer. And the, the reason he did, it was because, probably because I came to class in cleats and put mud all over it. I mean, you know, there, there's always two sides to every story, right? But I, um, you know, after I passed the PhD qualifying exam, he only called me Dr. Johnson because he recognized that, yeah, it probably wasn't the best thing to say four years earlier. But I can understand why he said that. So I think you just have to believe in yourself, um, get support. I had a fabulous uh, PhD advisor who was also my undergraduate mentor. He had three women PhD students in electrical engineering at the same time in the same group. One is El Eleanor Choa, who if you remember the astronaut that manipulated the robotic arm to fix the Hubble telescope, that was Ellen. We shared a lab together. I remember the day we walked out. She looked at the moon and said, I think I'll be an astronaut. And I went, yeah, right. <laughs> Learn to eat those words. Um, and then Chi Chi Chow, who became a uh, very successful entrepreneur in China and myself. And he believed in us, Joe Goodman at Stanford. And he's just terrific. So I think the yes, everybody, no matter who they are, uh, Will will be questioned on what they want to do. If you aim high enough, you just have to do it anyway, and then align yourself with people. Have that vision. Align yourself with people that uh, will believe in you. I think we have time for two more questions. Okay, we'll do our next one from the couches. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rowan. I'm studying mechanical engineering. I wanted to ask. Um, as you were going through your undergrad and your master's, your uh, PhD, your post PhD, um, and what, um, as you also filed the ranks and went up to undersecretary, I was wondering what was your main motivator? What really was your driving force that brought you to where you are today? Thank you. You know, I think that's a, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I've really, I don't think I've been asked that before, which. Um, as you can tell from my uh, rambling here, I'm not one for short of words, but um, I think it really comes back to my parents. So my mother was a f um, first generation immigrant from Ireland and grew up in the depression in New York City. Um, she understood, much like Gracie and a tree grows in Brooklyn, that education is what lifts us all out of the grime. That's a quote from the book. So I think it was her, her passion for, for knowledge. And there were seven of us. They, all the kids were pretty competitive uh, in everything. So I think it was quite the brood. And my, my dad was an electrical engineer. And um, again, you know, very, very interested in, in education. So I think it was really my parents. And we have our last question, I think. Yes, Chris? Hi, my name's Nicole. And I recently heard about some cyber attacks that were occurring in dams, and I was wondering, are there any initiatives in place that you're going to somehow uh, control stuff that happens in dams? You know, that's a, I, I would, if you have any um, references on that, I'd love to know what those are. I, you know, just let me know, because it is something I'm quite interested in. Uh, and I'll tell you why I'm interested in, in it is, um, we could probably get 25 to 30 percent more electricity from every power dam in the in the country, which would be significant. Uh, 
probably enough to almost power the entire U.S. government's electrical consumption. But we'd have to run them over the internet. And we'd have to run them remotely so that when they go down, it, if there's a power strike, a lightning, or they, they you know, low water and the turbine shut off, the next day there's water, you, you don't have to wait until someone comes out to restart them. You can restart them remotely. So we can actually run our, uh, some of our plants over the internet. We're doing it right now from an iPad. But if we want to do it more, we're going to have to ver be, you know, be secure. And, um, you know, I'm not too worried about the power plant because we can always just shut them down. It's more the, you know, the, the dams are th what hold the water back. Some of those we own, some of them we don't. So I, I'd be curious if you let me know about that so we can take that into our work that we're doing. So I'm going to take moderator's prerogative here and make room for just one more question from our very good friend and one of our trustees up here. Thank you very much. Uh, Jerry Doaz, a uh, member of the Board of Trustees here at NYU Poly, as well as the president of the Alumni Association. In terms of professional organizations that you've either been a member of or affiliated with, um, could you t share with us uh, which ones stand out and why? Wonderful question. Um, in fact, we talked about this a little bit before with some of the, the students. Is is um, if if I had to do my undergraduate career over again, I would have been active in SWE, Society for Women Engineers. Um, I would have been active in uh, NSBE. I would have been active in every engineering networking organization, even though I may not be a traditional member. I think it's important to be part of this engineering profession and encourage as many people as we can to get involved. So um, it's just, I it's balancing the time. And I, I think that there's a lot to be gained. It's just that every student, and we're all doing a trade-off on a daily basis of what I can do, what time I have. I've got these class, I've got midterms, I think it's midterm week here. So, um, and I, I think it the best, the the best ones are, it comes back to who the mentor, the faculty member, do, are they caring? Are they, you know, do they take the time to be involved? That's what I loved about being dean. I, I would um, spend a lot of time with the leadership and the individual groups of every engineering society because I thought it was important to try and encourage that love of the, the society. And it took, it takes time, but it's really worth it. So I wish I could be more direct on that, but it's a great question. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, before we close, I'm going to invite Bethany Gatsu from the NYU Leadership Initiative to come up and make our closing remarks. Oh. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I, I have learned so much listening to you. Um, and But there was one story you told in particular that I really hope all the students remember. Uh, and that's the one about your athletic training in college. <laughs> and when you said, you know, not everyone's meant to be an Olympian, but it's really important to know what you're made of. I think that is absolutely the foundation of leadership. Knowing what our strengths are, what we have to contribute, and stepping up and pushing ourselves to the very limit to contribute those on behalf of a cause that's greater than just our own self-interest. This is the kind of leadership that we are working to foster and develop in students across NYU. Uh, we're looking to develop leadership that is ethical, inclusive, and collaborative, because we see that as the kind of leadership that is going to help us make progress on the critical issues we face as a global society today. So I couldn't have asked for a better example of that kind of leadership than what we heard today. And I hope you'll all join me in thanking Dr. Johnson for being here, for speaking so candidly, and being so generous with your time. So I also want to thank the NYU Tandon School of Engineering for being a wonderful partner to us. Thank you, Professor oh. Jay, for uh, this great interview. And thank you to Anita Farrington and her team for really making this all possible. Anita, you want to come up? And uh, we just have a little token of appreciation for you. 
we always love a blue box with a white ribbon. So for you, oh, wow. don't forget us at Tandon because you have a fan base here, right? <laughs> Tandon, come on. Special, much. special thanks if I can. John Sexton hugged, so I'm, oh. I'm hugging on his. I'm hugging on his behalf. Thank, Thank you so, you. so much. Thank you. And um, I'm going to just turn things over again to, to Bethany. Why don't you give us a nice closing? And, and then please stay for the reception because I am known for feeding my kids as well. Yeah. <laughs> and Anita, I did my closing, so I have nothing more to give. Okay. But uh, no, I thank you all for coming. Um, and I think that you'll be here for 20 minutes or so. We have to be respectful. Dr. Johnson does have a flight to catch. Um, but I saw how generous you were with the students before. I'm sure you'll be open to speaking to some of them afterward. Uh, so please stick around for a while, enjoy some food, and good conversation. Thank you. Thank you.